us as well. So um, Dr. Hesman Pao, um, she is going to share a little bit about the entire series. So Linda, go ahead. Ah, oh, I'm not muted. Um, so the entire series, as um, Dr. Zhang was saying, um, we've got two different funding streams to be able to provide two different areas of support. What we're looking for here at the um, with the um, quality subgrant is looking at ways to be able to help support clinicians and family members, um, individuals that are professionals that are working with kids with autism. Um, or um, even just home and community-based service providers that are working with folks that have disabilities and would like to have some um, current state-of-the-art information about uh, social emotional development and how we can use evidence-based practices to be able to help to support them. So we're really excited that Dr. Turk has got her camera working. Um, I'm gonna quit sharing my screen at this point so that we can um, um, turn this over to Kari to give us an introduction to Dr. Turk so we can start our presentation for today. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for joining our PBS presentation today. Um, it's going to be over the triple vulnerability model of anxiety and depression. And so as uh, Dr. Heisman Powell mentioned, with us is Dr. Cindy Turk. So Dr. Turk is a professor and the chairperson of the Washburn Psychological Department, Psychology Department. Um, and Dr. Turk comes with us uh, with a large background and a very extensive background um, in presentations and publications, um, focusing uh, primarily on social anxiety and anxiety disorders. Um, she comes with us uh, to us with great knowledge um, of those disorders. Um, and we are very grateful that she's had the ability to come speak with us today. So. That said, please join me in welcoming Dr. Turk and Dr. Turk, take the floor. Thank you, Kari. All right, so you can hear me okay. And hopefully I won't be plagued with more difficulties. Let me see if I can find my presentation now. Nope, that's not it, hang on. Alrighty, da, 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 da. Maybe I don't have it open. Hang on here. I thought I did. Oh, here we go. Okay. Sorry, I'm struggling with technical difficulties. Believe it or not, I did teach via Zoom <laughs> during the pandemic, but I'm, I'm struggling some today. So, all right, here we go. All right, so can you guys see slides now? Yes? Yeah. Yes, you can, okay, great. Okay, and all right. So yes, I'm gonna be talking today about um, the triple vulnerability model by David Barlow. So this will, uh, some of this will be a repeat for Kari because I had I had Kari as a student, both as an undergraduate and graduate student. So I remember back when I first started teaching at Washburn, she was in one of my first abnormal psychology undergraduate classes that I taught. And she was the best student in the class who went on to uh, do her undergraduate capstone with me, which she published. And she completed our master's program and did her master's thesis with me. So um, I was very honored when she asked me to do this talk. Um, now, to let you know, my specialty is adults. Um, and as Kari said, it's especially adults with social anxiety. Um, however, I do teach our advanced psychopathology course. And part of that course is talking about the etiology of various disorders. And so I thought that this audience, which I understand is comprised of a lot of parents who are interested in mental health issues. Um, I thought that this is a topic that perhaps even as an adult psychologist might be of interest to um, a lot of you. Okay, so um, for today's agenda, um, 
Obviously, in 45 minutes, I can only cover so much of David Barlow's model. Um, I'm going to highlight talking first some about genetic predispositions and what that means. Then I'll move on to talking about a big part of his model, which is that a diminished sense of control is related to being vulnerable to anxiety and depressive disorders. And then after that, I'm gonna be talking about how um, parenting can relate to a diminished sense of control. I do wanna be clear, there's multiple paths to um, having a diminished sense of control in early life. I'm focusing on parenting here in our limited time, just because I thought that that might be of interest to this audience, but I also don't want to have people walk away thinking that, oh, when people end up having problems with anxiety, it's all the parents' fault. In no way is that the case. There's multiple paths to the top of the mountain. Um, there are many environmental experiences that can contribute to the development of anxiety in adulthood. And there has been some research on how parenting can impact that. And I'm gonna emphasize that in this talk, but that is not to imply that um, parenting is the only way to get there. All right. And all right, so if you wanna learn more about this topic, um, this is a seminal book in the area of anxiety. It talks a lot about where does anxiety come from and what are its maintaining factors. And it also talks specifically about um, each of the anxiety and related disorders like the obsessive compulsive disorders and trauma related disorders. So um, it is an excellent resource if you wanna learn more. All right, so this is just an overview of the model. Um, I'm going to be talking the most about that upper box with the generalized biological vulnerability. I'll be talking about it. I'll also be talking about that generalized psychological vulnerability. I'm not really going to get into very much at all about the specific psychological vulnerability. Um, the, the point of giving this overview though is that this model is fundamentally a diathesis stress model. Diathesis meaning vulnerability, that people have vulnerabilities and Barlow would say that you must have a biological vulnerability and a psychological vulnerability. And then those vulnerabilities are combined with stress and the outcome of the combination of all of those things is an anxiety or a related disorder, again, like one of the stress related disorders or also depression as well. Um, that is the combination of these things that leads to that outcome of having a disorder. That last box with the specific psychological vulnerability, that is the aspect of the person's learning history that taught them what's dangerous. So this model proposes that anxiety disorders, all of the anxiety and related disorders, including depression, they share common vulnerabilities, but what form the disorder takes depends on some specific things in, learn, in a person's learning history that, that can focus these general vulnerabilities into a particular area. So for instance, a person who um, has the biological and psychological vulnerability plus stress, um, but they had a lot of important lessons in their life telling them that other people can be very dangerous or that the opinions of other people are really important. Well, that might shape those vulnerabilities into the specific disorder of social anxiety disorder. Or you might take a person who has had early learning experiences telling them bodily sensations were dangerous. Um, maybe they have good cause to think bodily sensations are dangerous. Perhaps dad in his 30s had a heart attack um, and was very sick or even died. Well, that can teach you that bodily sensations can be dangerous. Um, or maybe um, they just had a parent who was very concerned every time something was wrong um, in their body or else their kids, like having symptoms of being sick, they would get very anxious and upset. Um, those kinds of early learning experiences about the potential danger of bodily sensations could shape the disorder in the direction of panic disorder. Okay, so anyway, you can see from this model that one of the main points is, is the development of psychological disorders is complex. Um, it's complex, and although in the, the things that we get in the media might want to try to simplify it down to uh, a single factor, like it's all genetics or it's all trauma, 
that is really not how we understand things. Disorders develop when people have a variety of vulnerabilities that are activated by stress, and then that leads to the outcome of, anxiety, of clinically significant anxiety or depression. And the point being, if any of these vulnerabilities are missing, a disorder won't develop. So a person can have a biological vulnerability to a disorder, but they don't experience the, the, the other vulnerabilities or they manage to not experience a significant stressor, well, that biological vulnerability will never be manifested in the form of a clinical disorder. All right, so let's talk about that generalized biological vulnerability. Um, so one thing that the literature looking into genetics shows is that there is not a genes to disorder um, a direct genes to disorder link. So it's not like there's an OCD gene that causes you to manifest obsessive compulsive disorder. There's not a panic disorder gene that causes you to manifest panic disorder. Um, instead, we, uh, what there are, there are multiple genes. There's not just one gene that codes for anxiety and depression problems. Um, research suggests that there's multiple genes that lead to a genetic predisposition that makes it possible to develop these disorders, but whether or not a disorder develop, develops will be determined um, by its interaction with environmental experiences. Now, people without this vulnerability, life is easier because they can have bad things happen to them and they're not gonna develop a disorder. But in the context of a genetic predisposition, environmental experiences can interact with them. Difficult environmental experiences can inter interact to produce a disorder. Um, okay. Uh, it's a minor point, but David Barlow also argues from his review of the literature that there are probably separate um, vulnerabilities for being anxious um, and depressed from um, having a tendency to panic that tendency to panic might have a separate but overlapping genetic basis. Now, if you have this vulnerability, how is this manifested? Um, so again, it's not necessarily manifested as a full-blown anxiety disorder, but you might see this vulnerability coming through in other ways, such as temperamental factors. So early in life, you can see infants and young children um, and especially when you're talking about young infants who haven't had a lot of experience with the world yet, um, when you're seeing differences in um, like how, you know, reactive and difficult to soothe and things like that they are, um, that's probably showing some differences in biologically based temperament. And then over the course of life, temperament is influenced by the environment. Um, and it's been studied in a lot of different ways in psychology. There's a whole literature on this idea of neuroticism. Um, if you think of a character that might be considered neurotic, think of like George Costanza in Seinfeld, right? He's a very neurotic character. Um, we, would, we would guess that he probably has a generalized biological vulnerability um, to anxiety, as well as some life experiences that probably further shaped him in that direction. So this genetic vulnerability is going to make the person more prone to negative emotions they're more likely to be behaviorally in, in, inhibited, so kind of wary um, and reserved as kids. And also it probably contributes to trait anxiety. So in layperson's terms, this vulnerability contributes to a person being kind of high strung or emotional. Um, Barlow would say what is inherited is a tendency to be very reactive biologically to environmental changes. So to in recent years, I've been trying, uh-oh, Where's my video? Okay, hopefully this video is going to play for you. We're gonna see how this goes. Um, temperament differences um, aren't just for humans. Uh, you probably see different pets with different temperament differences, right? Um, I have a poodle and a golden retriever. My golden retriever is very laid back. Nothing really gets to her. My poodle is very reactive. He has a much more high strung reactive temperament. So we're gonna look at some, um, monkeys, there's a researcher whose name is Steve Sumi, and he's done research looking um, at uh, anxiety in monkeys. And so this was a monkey who has been uh, bred to be calm. And so let's go ahead and watch that first and let's hope this works. Oh, the cord is 
delicious days in zero is an egg. This is a newborn, just six days old. The personalities of their monkeys right from birth have been checked out by Steve's research team. There he goes, good. Definitely, oh, look at this, almost giving definitely a warning for the reach and follow. At this age, an infant hasn't really had time to learn how to behave. So if they can detect any personality, it must be genetic. Okay, there we go. They give standard development tests like the ones human infants might get. And all the time, they're sizing up personality. This one obviously takes life as it comes. Nothing much seems to bother him. All right, now let's take a look at a reactive monkey. Oops, hang on. Sorry, more technical difficulties here. Okay, this is the reactive monkey with the more neurotic temperament. And I wanna be clear here when I show this, um, if we were to watch the monkey we just saw and this monkey hanging out in their home area with mom, they wouldn't look that different. They're going to look different here because this is a novel situation. These monkeys have never been separated from their mom before and they're in an unfamiliar place. It's a very stressful situation. So it's under these conditions of stress that the differences in temperament manifest themselves. Here's another newborn. No, he's not sick. He's just very, very nervous. He's reacting to the stress of separation from his mother, who is of the nervous protective type. In fact, the stress is so overwhelming for him that Mary Schneider will find it hard to administer the test. The researchers call this type of behavior reactive. Okay. Uh, and obviously these monkeys have been bred kind of for the extremes of temperament. Temperament is kind of distributed in the across the population in a more normal uh, kind of distribution kind of way. Oops, here we go. Hang on. Let's try to go to the next slide. Oh, tell you what. There we go. Okay. Um, all right. So we've pretty much covered this. A genetic predisposition may or may not manifest as an anxiety disorder or clinical depression. It's going to depend on the environment. Genetics do make a contribution to anxiety and depressive disorders. They estimate that as about 40%. Of, the, of accounting for about 40% of the variability that you see. Um, but that means the majority of variability is caused by the environment. So the environment is really important. Um, and I'm just kind of curious. So if, if you were um, thinking about, you're talking to someone, a child or an adult for the first time, and you're wondering if they have a generalized biological vulnerability, what kinds of questions might you ask them if you wanna put that in the chat? Any, any thoughts on that? This is a good question. Let's see some answers yeah, here. Feel, feel free to throw things out there and, um, you know, whatever you think. And it's actually kind of a hard question too. I can tell you one of the things that we do, uh, it's one of the reasons you ask about family history, right? Um, yeah, so a child, a child that's fussy, exactly. So a child that's fussy is kind of reactive, not easily soothed. That can be a sign of some of these temp, um, temperament factors. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can also ask, you know, again, I talk to adults more, but were you the kind of kid that, um, like if something went wrong or someone criticized you, like you really took it to heart and it hit you hard, um, as opposed to other people, they, they might go through the same thing and it just rolled off their back. That kind of thing can be, you know, a sign of kind of a temperament factor. What are they like in new situations? Exactly. Um, are new situations tough for them? Are they reticent? Are they someone who can dive right in? Those kinds of things can um, show differences in temperament. Okay. But again, fortunately, temperament is not destiny. And not only that, the other thing that I'll say to clients is that, you know what? This is about being a, reset, or a, a reactive, sensitive, and emotional person. And yes, things can go wrong. That can interact with environmental factors that can lead down the path to an anxiety disorder or a depressive disorder. But you know what? It can also, being a sensitive and emotional person can also make you kind and it can make you good to other people. 
Um, this does not have to be all a, a bad thing, even though um, sometimes it can lead to down the path to a disorder, although not necessarily. Okay, let's go ahead to the next slide. Again, it's going to cooperate. It's kind, it's kind of laggy. There we go. Okay. We're going to move on to talking about the generalized psychological vulnerability. So if we're going to say someone ends up neurotic like George Costanza, there are probably also environmental contributions to that. And the thing that Barlow emphasizes in on this dimension is the issue of having a sense of control. His dedication at the front of his book that I have in italics there, he dedicates the book to his children and he says to them, may you continue to retain your illusion of control. And he said that of all the things in his book, I've seen him give a talk where he said that um, that's one of the things people comment upon most frequently. Um, I suppose it's debatable how much control we actually have. Now it's probably fair to say that adults have more control over their lives than kids. Um, but one thing that is quite clear is that from a psychological perspective, having the, per the perception that you have control um, is quite helpful for good psychological outcomes. And to the extent that you have a diminished sense of control, that is a vulnerability factor for the development of anxiety or depression. It does not, it's no different than what we just talked about with biological factors. A diminished sense of control does not inevitably lead to anxiety disorder disorders or depressive disorders, but it is a vulnerability factor that makes um, it more likely that a person might have a problem in that area. This diminished sense of control is thought to develop early in life. We're going to look at some experimental evidence from animals um, uh, that speak to the importance of a sense of control. Um, and again, there are likely multiple paths to a diminished sense of control. I'm going to get to some stuff talking about how certain parenting styles can lead to a diminished sense of control. That is not the only way that you can develop a diminished sense of control, though. It's not all about parenting styles. All right, so we're going to look at an animal study just speaking to um, how important the perception of control can be even in... Um, an animal like a rat that's less complicated than we human beings. So what they did with these rats is they put them in a little contraption and they hooked it up so that the, the rats um, could get shocks, could get electric shocks. So this is obviously a negative bad thing happening to the rats when they get these negative shocks. The rats were in pairs. So, um, the, the rat um, was wired to get electric shock, but it was wired such that there was another rat in an identical contraption who whenever the first rat, which in my diagram here is the escape rat, whenever that rat got a shock, at the same time, the yoked rat would also get a shock. Now, the difference between the pairs though, is that both, both um, rats had contraptions with levers but one lever actually worked. So when the rat got shocked, they could push the lever and the shock would stop. The other rat had a lever in there, but it didn't do anything, okay? So the difference between the two conditions is control. Um, they get the same timing, duration, intensity of shock, but the difference is how much shock the one rat gets when and when it happens they have no control over. It's determined by the, one, the, the rat, the escape rat, the experimental rat that can push the lever and stop it. Um, the, the other little thing that they had in here, and um, Barlow does talk about this as being um, relevant to his model, is that unpredictable bad things can have an impact too. So this experiment looked both at controllability and unpredictability. Um, some of these pairs, they would get a beep before the shock happened so that the shocks were at least predictable. Um, other sets of rats, no beep. The shocks would just come and the one rat could stop them and the other rat just hung out until it was over. Okay. All right. So getting into the results, let's start out by looking at that issue of control. So whether there was a warning signal or not, um, the rats that had the control um, what they did was they went, and so for rats, you can't really ask them how anxious they are, but you can look at how stressed and anxious they were by examining the number of gastric ulcers they develop. So after this study, these rats were autopsied and they counted the number of gastric ulcers that the rats had. So you can see having a sense of control 
The rats with control, the light blue bar, they develop fewer gastric ulcers, a sign of stress and anxiety compared to the rats that were yoked and had no control. And so it didn't matter whether there was a warning signal or no warning signal, there was a benefit of having a sense of control. There, there were less bad outcomes. Now, the predictability of the negative bad things helped too. Um, so you can see that, the, that um, irrespective of control, having a warning did help mitigate the effect of stress and anxiety. All right, so that's my question to you. Now, what, what would be a human being analog to this? So what are unpredictable and uncontrollable negative events that might happen to children early in life and predispose them to anxiety and depression? We would think an environment like that where unpredictable and uncontrollable negative things are happening early in life, that can set the stage for the child developing a diminished sense of control, kind of like the rats that had no control. Um, and, that can, and then that in turn, Barlow would say, sets the stage for anxiety and depression. Okay, someone said divorce. And of course, leading up to divorce, you know what, probably things aren't great at home. Uh, are there unpredictable fights between mom and dad or maybe people storm off and leave and, Okay, so, right, so uh, parental fighting, divorce, child sickness, sure. Um, and of course, seeing adults with these disorders, I mean, you know, sometimes they have, um, you know, an alcoholic parent that when they're drinking, they fly into rages and bad things happen. Is that that different than the shocks that we just saw um, the rats exper um, experience? Oh, now this next one leads perfectly, lack of food and shelter due to income. All right, so this is focused on bad things happening to you. So unpredictable negative bad things happened, happening to you when you're early in your life can lead to a diminished sense of control, which has been related to problems with anxiety and depression later. It's a factor that's a vulnerability. Bad, as you saw in that experiment, bad things happen to you didn't necessarily mean that things turned out that bad for you. It's when bad things happen to you and you perceive them as predictable and uncontrollable that things are really bad. Okay, but this idea of lack of food and shelter due to income. All right, so let me, we're gonna look at an, a, 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 first another animal analog to this kind of situation. So what they did in this study, um, because you do experiments because you can actually talk about cause and you can't do these kinds of experiments for obvious reasons with people. All right, so they're, they're trying to see what happens is, um, is fear and anxiety affected by not just bad things happening like with the shocks, but also unpredictable access to good things, unpredictable access to things like nurturing food, shelter, and so on. So in this study, what they did was about as soon as they could, they took infant monkeys away from their moms and they raised them in groups with other monkeys the same age, groups of about four or five. And some of the monkeys were in groups that were master monkey groups. These monkeys were able to push levers and they were able to access food, drink, and treats. So treats like Fruit Loops and chocolate chips and things like that. So they had control over those things. There were yoked monkeys. Those yoked monkeys got the same amount of food, drink, and treats. There was no difference, but they did not have control over when they got them. All right, so then what they did was after raising them like this from ages two to seven months, they wanted to assess how fearful are these monkeys. And of course, they're predicting that the monkeys who have had a life where they've had more control um, over accessing these positive things, that they're going to be able to better regulate their emotions and have less fear compared to the other monkeys. So how do you assess fear in a monkey? I do not have footage from this experiment but they modeled what they did based on some of the work of Harry Harlow, who did some very famous work related to attachment using monkeys. So they used procedures similar to his. So you're only gonna see a single monkey here, but what they did with these monkeys to assess fear is they exposed them to this scary mechanical robot. Um, and the monkeys will naturally, and they expose the whole group of them. So they will naturally cling together and run to the back of the cage and hide that's how they're showing fear. And this is just a single monkey and the monkey isn't gonna to run to other monkeys. It's gonna to run to this kind of uh, fake mother here. But this will give you an idea of how you might measure fear in monkeys.
Now, in this experiment, this is the apparatus we use. That looks diabolic. That's just the way the baby monkey feels about it. Placing on loud sounds, moving mechanical parts, all of these things that decide to frighten a monkey. Now, here we have a peaceful, resting baby monkey. Let's find out what his reaction to his mother are when we frighten him. Okay, so that they, they did something similar to that. All right, so what were the results? So their measure of fear is second spin in the back of the cage, clinging to each other in a clump, <laughs> clinging, clumping. So the first two trials, I mean, this is such a novel, scary situation that there was no difference between the two groups um, after being, so they exposed them to the monkey and then they took the scary thing away. And how long did they stay clinging together in a clump? It was similar for the two groups. Um, however, they did this six times altogether over the course of a few days. Um, when you get to trials three and four, you start to see differences between the two groups emerging, where the monkeys who had control in their life, they stop clinging so much and start exploring their cage again um, sooner than the monkeys who never had control in their life. And then you see the same pattern on trials five and six um, the master monkeys who had control, they leave the clump sooner than the other monkeys. They didn't just look at that, they also looked at exploration. When we explore our world, it's when we're calm. When we're very stressed and anxious, we're not engaging in a lot of exploratory behaviors and learning. And so again, to give you an idea of what this measurement looks like, um, this is also from Harry Harlow's work, not this particular experiment, but it gives you an idea of what they did with these monkeys. This room is just such a new and strange environment for the baby monkey. No mother is in there. Now, let's put a monkey into the room. <laughs> Notice how cautiously he enters the room. Okay, so um, they also looked at ex exploration. Now the difference is, is that they put the whole monkey group, so they put the whole monkey master monkey group into the room and watched what they did, as opposed to a single monkey, like in that um, example video. Oh no, nope, nope. Sorry, trying to get my slide to advance. Okay, so what they did, just how they introduced that monkey in the cage. That particular monkey went out of the cage right away. Um, but again, this is a scary new environment. Um, the monkeys have never been here before, so it's a novel situation. And how do they react to it? Well, the monkeys that had control, well, actually, let's start with the monkeys who did not have control. They did this three times that they were brought to this room. How long did it take for them to leave that little cage? The monkeys who never had control on all three top trials, they never left the cage for the whole 10 minutes. They stayed huddled in the cage together. Now, again, the very first time the monkeys who had control were in the cage, um, were in that room, they didn't leave either. It was a stressful situation for um, any monkey, irrespective of background. But the ones who had the control experience on trial two, they came out after about six minutes. At trial three, they came out after only a couple of minutes. So that's a sign of the, them feeling calm and secure enough to start exploring their world. And you notice that room had different items in it. How much did they explore the items in the room? So they measure that by number of items touched. At every single time point, you see more of that for the master monkeys um, compared to the monkeys who did not have control. So leading to another question, what would be an example of unpredictable and uncontrollable access to getting basic needs met in children early in life? Um, and again, someone did already give one good answer to that question was, you know what, sometimes people have poverty and when you have poverty, um, maybe it's inconsistent when your lights and heat are on, maybe it's inconsistent when you get food. 
Um, there can also be other things too, you know, again, thinking of some of the clients we see, um, a client might say something like, you know, mom was on and off drugs during my life. And sometimes she'd disappear for a whole weekend and it would be just me and my younger brother at ages four and six fending for ourselves with what little food was in the house doing the best we could, not knowing when she'd come back. All right. So you can see how early experiences like that can set the stage for having a diminished sense of control with that diminished sense of control being um, a potential risk factor. Okay, someone experiencing a disaster, withholding of um, attention and affection, parents with mental health conditions, sure. You know, again, so uh, a mental health condition like a substance abuse problem, um, or you know what, maybe sometimes a parent has times they're so depressed that they can't get out of bed and take care of the kids anymore. So sure, that's a good example. Um, okay, so you can, see, you can see how that that could work with, with people. Right. Let me get my slides, laggy slides to advance. So I cite this article for a review um, to get an internalized sense of control, which is more protective against developing anxiety and depression. That sort of parenting is characterized by warmth, sensitivity, consistency, and responsiveness. Um, it's also characterized by encouragement of autonomy and an absence of an intrusive or over-controlling style. And really, when you look at the opposite of these things, the, that is parenting that sets the stage for a diminished sense of control by the child and sets the stage for potential problems with anxiety. Again, it's not destiny. Other things have to be present, like a genetic vulnerability and stress, but it can set the stage for a vulnerability for developing problems later. Now, we've talked about... Um, bad things happening and that leading to a diminished sense of control that can lead to anxiety. We've talked about lack of access to good things in a predictable way that that can set the stage for a diminished sense of control and problems with anxiety and depression. What do you think of this idea of over-controlling parenting leading to a diminished sense of control and, and anxiety later in life? Why would that be the case? What do you think about that? Right, so no autonomy. They don't have a chance to learn that the world can be safe. Uh huh. They might rebel. Yeah, well, that can actually, that can happen, right? And that can lead to um, other problems besides just depression and anxiety. Sure. They never develop confidence in their own abilities. Yes. They can feel like they're never good enough. Uh huh. Yep. Okay. So let's talk about this a little bit. Laggy slides. There we go. All right. So one of the one of the ways um, psychologists think about this a lot is that well, an over controlling parent is going to help their child avoid. Don't do that. It's too dangerous, right? We, we we can't do that. We know that avoidance is one of the most important factors when it comes to um, the maintenance of anxiety problems. When a child avoids, they don't have a chance to learn that just because something could be threatening, it doesn't mean that there's actually danger there because most of the bad things that could happen don't. And so avoidance, avoidance keeps you from learning that. Um, they don't have a chance to learn that they actually can exert some control in threatening situations. And even when things are threatening that perhaps they can cope better than they thought that they would. Um, and so these things are, are all relevant. So let's take a look at a study that looked at um, parenting styles and um, anxiety. So in this study, they took the parents of clinically anxious children and the parents of children in the community who weren't being seen for any treatment. Um, and the parents were told that the child is going to solve a series of very difficult puzzles as a test of the child's cognitive ability. So they weren't told that they're actually looking at parenting in this study because you know what, you know, we all, we all try to present ourselves as like perfect parents, right? Um, and they wanted the parents to be more natural in their behavior. So they said that this is a test of the child's cognitive abilities, but they set the tests up so hard um, that the, the, the puzzle that children were solving, they were always given puzzles that were for a higher developmental age so that the, the children were inevitably going to have a lot of difficulty with these puzzles, but the parents and children weren't told this. The parents were told that you're in the room while the child is doing these puzzles just for support. 
The parents were given answers to the puzzles so that we made sure that all the parents really did know how to solve them. And the parents were told that, you know what, you can help the child only if the child really needs it. Then later on, they videotaped all of these um, interactions and they coded them later. So intrusion and involvement was coded by um, exactly how much help did the parent provide? How many times did the parent give help when the child didn't even ask? The mom's getting so involved that she's manipulating the puzzle pieces herself instead of letting the child do it. So things like that were coded. And also negativity, how tense was mom? How much negative affect did she have? Did she make negative comments toward the child during the task? So consistent with what you might think, um, the, the moms of the anxious kids, you can see them in the light blue, the moms of the non-anxious kids are in the darker blue. On that measure of involvement, we see more involvement, getting involved in the task by the moms of the anxious kids compared to the moms of the non-anxious kids. We also see more negativity from the moms of the um, anxious kids compared to the moms of the non-anxious kids. Um, so this is consistent with what we were talking about earlier. And this is just one study. There are other studies like that, but I show you this just so you can see how these kinds of things are measured. So though, that's an example of a human study with moms being kind of over controlling and maybe also negative. Uh, you can see monkeys kind of doing the same thing. So you're going to see different monkey parenting types here. The boldest babies have a particular kind of mind. Well, here we have an infant that's unusually bold, um, well away from its mother, and it's interacting with these other older monkeys. It's playing like crazy. Um, but for him to keep this up, he has to make sure his mother is still around. So he will be going back to his mother just for a brief period of time, just to see that she's there. And then satisfied, he'll go back out and start to play about again. And this is how a mother gives her infant security. That is, she is available when the infant is frightened or needs some comfort, but she doesn't interfere when he goes out to explore. Now here's the other extreme, a clinging baby, which goes along with a mother who is very nervous. She likes to keep her baby well out of harm's way. All right, so... The Oops. babies have a particular kind of mom. Sorry, if I can get this to advance. Here we go. Okay. So Steve Sumi and his research, what he did. So the video we just saw, there's a match there. Those monkeys share both genetics and they also share environment, right? So the anxious mom has anxious genes that she passed on to her anxious child. And then the anxious mom is also being over controlling with their anxious child, which probably further um, enhances the anxious baby's anxiety. Um, so Steve Sumi wants to show, wants to see if environment can impact that temperament. So that, that's what these cross fostering studies do. So what he does, he takes an anxious infant, like the one we saw at the beginning of this talk, that's very nervous in the novel situation and takes it from its biological anxious mom and gives it to be raised by a non-anxious mom. So that gives us a chance to look at the interaction between temperament and environment. Is temperament destiny? Or if you take that anxious temperament and you give it, um, you give the child with that anxious temperament a very good environment that's predictable, consistent, not overly controlling and so on, um, what happens? And so here's some video that, that talks about what happens. Two months later, adopted baby and foster mother are getting along fine. But is there any change in the baby? Has his mother somehow taught him her more relaxed approach to life? It seems she has. Now he's showing all the signs of being a bold young monkey, happy to play on his own. Not what you'd expect from his nervous reactive behavior as a newborn. Even more convincing evidence that the foster mother has changed the baby's behavior comes from this exploration test being set up by Kathleen Rasmussen. The baby's living group will be enticed from its familiar cage with a trail of food. This new situation makes them all a little nervous. For the adopted baby, 
It'll be the first trip out of the cage. That's especially stressful. Still, bananas are a powerful inducement, so they head down the tunnel. Throughout this high stress time, the baby has been clinging firmly to his foster mother. Suddenly, there's a squabble, prompting the whole group to scramble back to the security of the cage. But just a few minutes later, the bananas reassert their power, and amazingly enough, the adopted baby is striding out boldly on his own. It's too much even for his relaxed foster mother, so she tries to hold him back. But he's having none of it. It's a typical bold behavior pattern. Transformation from timid newborn seems complete. Okay. So that goes back to the idea that, you know, genetics are not destiny, that it's really a combination of environment and um environment and genetics that leads leads to different outcomes. All right, uh, I guess we're still doing okay on time. Now, obviously we can't do experimental studies like that with human beings. And probably the next best thing we can do is look at um, longitudinal studies. So we're getting near the end here. So I'm gonna to try to go through this kind of quickly. One of the ways that you assess a more, um, anxious inhibited temperament in children is you do a situation similar to what they did in this study. So they brought mom and the child into a room that had a bunch of toys and mom is um, sitting down and she's filling out some questionnaires. And while she does that, the child um, can do what the child wants, can stay there by mom. To the extent that the child doesn't explore much and stays by mom, that's a sign of a more um, behaviorally in inhibited temperament. Um, to the extent that the child goes out and explores, that, that shows less inhibition. And then they also do some challenges. So they'll have a stranger come into the room. So a stranger came into the room um, after a while with a truck and invited the child to play. The more the child approaches the stranger and you know, interacts with the truck, the less inhibited they are. The more the child hangs back and won't get involved, the more inhibited they are. And then that stranger leaves, another stranger comes in with a robot, does the same thing. That stranger leaves, another stranger comes in with a cool tunnel you can call, crawl through, tries to get the child involved. And so they're measuring how much is the child willing to uh, approach the, the, the stranger and play with these, these toys. And that, that's their measure of inhibition. They were also, they, similar to the other study we talked about, um, they coded how intrusive is mom so does mom try to get involved with what the child is doing, even when the child isn't having any difficulty or distress? So being over-involved was coded. Um, and then also was the mother negative and derisive toward um, the child during um, this observation period. So all of this happened at age two, then they didn't do anything for two years, all right? And so then they wanted to see what happens when you bring this child, the same children back at age four. This setup is a little different for a little older child. So in, um, in this, rather than being in the room with mom, mom isn't there at all. It's, it's groups of four kids. And they had instructional free play, then they had a cleanup task, then they did show and tell, and they did a ticket sorting task, and then they did some more playtime. Um, so throughout this series, what they're interested in is how much does the child just kind of stand there and be quiet and not get involved? That's a measure of being more reticent. Um, to, or to what extent does the child get involved in the activities, talk to other people and so on, that's a sign of being less reticent. So what did they find? Um, so if mothers behaved in either a psychologically controlling or derisive measure, then toddler inhibition at age two predicted social reticence at age four. But here's where the interaction comes in. For mothers who were not psychologically controlling and they were not negative toward their child, there was no relationship between being inhibited the first time and being reticent later. So you can see the parallel with the monkey study we just talked about, that um, that temperament does not necessarily lead to a more anxious inhibited outcome. It's going to depend on environmental factors, parenting being one possible environmental factor. It's usually not the only factor, but this is some evidence that parenting can be important. All right, so avoidance behavior is considered the most important thing that maintains anxiety. Why is that? What do you think? Uh, 
Okay. Yeah. Avoidance behaviors are reinforced because like, so you, um, oh, I have a big job interview. I decide, you know what? I'm never going to get it. I'm so anxious. I just can't do this. I don't go, oh, relief. <coughs> oh, I feel better. And so next time I feel anxious like that, I'm not going to do whatever it was that was making me anxious either. Right. <coughs> All right. There's the key. You can never learn. You can do things. So it's reinforced. It's very understandable why we avoid. We feel better in the short term while we avoid. It leads to an unsatisfying life in the long term. <coughs> but in the short term, we feel a lot better. But the problem is um, when you avoid, you never learn anything new. You never learn that what you're afraid of usually doesn't happen. You also never learn that you can handle things better than you thought. <coughs> so. Um, so let's let's look at um, let's look at some research. This is family enhancement of avoidant responses. So in this study, um, there were non anxious there were anxious and non anxious children and their parents. So the children were pre presented with an ambiguous situation and asked, "What would you do?" The parents were presented separately with the same situation and asked, "What would your child do in this ambiguous situation?" Then the parents and children came together to discuss the two ambiguous situations. And then after this discussion, the child was asked to give their final solution. So what were the situations like? All right, so the child was said, you know what, on the way to school, you feel funny in your tummy. What, is you, what, what do you think is happening and what would you do? And do you wanna type your answer to that in the box? What, what, what would you make of that? So on the way to school, you feel funny in your tummy. What do you think is happening and what would you do? Or you can answer for your child if you prefer. We won't know if you're answering for yourself or your child, but what do you think? Could be excitement, exactly, okay? Because these responses are gonna be coded. That you know what, maybe I'm excited about the field trip we're going on today and I would just go about my day, sure. I'm nervous about some part of my day at school. Today's show and tell day. Um, and you know what, uh, this is because I'm nervous and you know what, maybe I better go to the nurse and ask if I can go home. Right. Okay. So anyway, I mean, children answered what they did um, and it, it was, their answers were coded. So some were physical threat situations and some were social threat situations. Trying to get to my next slide. There we go. You see a group of students from another class playing a great game. As you walk over, you notice they're laughing. What do you think is happening? What would you do? And so you see this is ambiguous. You think, well, I think that they're laughing because they're having a good time and I'd ask to join in. You could do a more threatening um, <coughs> interpretation. I think that they're laughing at me. And so I would get away from them. Um, and so the solutions were <coughs> coded as pro-social and constructive or aggressive. Because um, you can get answers like, I think they're laughing at me, so I'm going to punch them. Um, um, or avoidant, and that's, or avoidance. So what did they find? Um, let's look at the pre-discussion. This is the child on their own. What did they come up with? Well, you see that children in both groups, both anxious and non-anxious, come up with avoidant responses. That's what we're looking at here. Um, you can see that the anxious children, um, the percentage of them uh, giving an avoidant response is higher, but I think that this was actually not a significant difference. So the interesting part of this study is, is that remember they came up with this on their own about decisions to avoid, but then they talked to their parents about the situation. And then after that, they had to come back <coughs> to the experimenter separate from the parents. So the parents didn't hear their answer and give their final solution. So the interesting part here is that the anxious children, their avoidant final solution skyrocketed to over 60%. Whereas for the non-anxious children, it actually, they weren't all that avoided in the first place, but they became even less avoided. So there's something about the things that the parents are talking to the kids about with this situation that is actually encouraging avoidant responses. And we know that avoidance is a really important thing when it comes to maintaining anxiety. All right, so, oh, we're pretty much at the end now, aren't we? So we have talked about a genetic predisposition. We've talked about this um, diminished sense of control in the context of stress. We would expect this to lead to anxiety and depressive disorders. And I know we're pretty much out of time. Um, 
thank you for coming. And um, I guess I could potentially take a question or two, or maybe I need to turn it back over to Kari. Yeah, um, Dr. Turk, if you could go to the next, the end slide. Oh, sure. Okay. Yep, we didn't really have time for this. I hope you did have some good takeaways from this, but we're at the end. Is this what is this where you want to be? Yeah. Okay. So we want to say thanks to everybody for coming and just remind you that we have a couple of upcoming webinars as well. We have the developmental stages for social emotional growth that Dr. Ashley Flat Fowler is going to be presenting in July. And then we have Tiffany Ward, who's going to be presenting um, teaching emotions to young children for social emotional health. With the if you could go to the next slide, Dr. Turk, please. Um, if you want more um, information, we would be happy to schedule a conference call with you. You could schedule KCART um, dash training at kumc.edu. We have funding to be able to provide a little bit of extra support as well. And then is there one more slide, Dr. Turk? Uh, I don't think so. Either that or it doesn't want to advance. Okay. All right. And so... Um, most importantly for this, we want to say thank you, Dr. Turk. This was a perfect, you know, first presentation in the series. It was wonderful. So thank if you, you have a little me. bit of time, if you have a minute or two, if somebody has a question. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to keep anybody who has another engagement, but I can stay around for a few minutes. If there was one question um, in the chat from earlier from Kari. Um, why might one sibling have a very high or clinically significant anxiety and the other might not if they were raised in the same household? Right. Well, you probably think about the different factors that I talked about. So, um, you know, siblings, they only share half of their genetics, right? So it's possible for two siblings to have different temperaments. So that vulnerability can be different. And siblings do have a shared environment um, to an extent, I mean, it's different being an older child versus a middle child versus a younger child. Um, so there are shared experiences, but there's also differences in experiences. Um, and then also, um, you know, maybe one sibling, again, has negative bad things happen to them, like they're the kid that's bullied at school, but their sibling is not. Um, so probably the main difference would be is that yes, even though those siblings have things in common, they also have things that they don't have in common and where they have those things that are not in common is probably how you're getting to a point that um, one might have, um, for instance, anxiety to the point that it's a problem, but the other one's doing okay. Awesome. I think that's, how, I think that's how David Barlow would answer that. <laughs> Anyone else have questions? You can put them in the chat or ask them. Dr. Turk, thank you so much for taking your time thank today. Thank you so much. Yeah, happy to do it. Thank you. Good luck with your series. Of course, thanks. Dr. Turk, I'll send them to Teresa as well. So if you have any students that might want to participate throughout the coming year, they're welcome to jump on. Oh, okay, great. Perfect. Well, thank you all. Thanks, Dr. Turk. Thank you. No problem. See you next month. <laughs>